limitations to, and I'm quoting here, to emphasize the natural behavior of the whales. Um, and this is... So obviously you do not have to be on this call. It's just an option if you want to. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> only if you feel like you... I think so we're good um and this is so some people are saying it's because of the film blackfish um but the chief executive of SeaWorld says that it's not because of the activism it's because of feedback they heard from the guests and I actually saw personally a lot of people posting on Facebook like yay oh my god orca presentations are going to be or the orca shows are over, but that's not actually true. They're just changing them and they might be changing them for the better. And a lot of people are saying this is also because there's um, new legislation trying to go through to prevent the breeding of captive killer whales. So they're trying to maybe kind of prepare themselves for if this goes through. Um, does anyone have any comments or do you think that this is a step in the right direction? Um, do you think that this really is San Diego, uh, SeaWorld kind of responding to the activists, even though the CEO says it's not? Um, do you mind if I interject quickly? Just go. So what we do during these forums um, is we mute ourselves uh, when we're not speaking in order to just help with reducing feedback. Um, and obviously, if um, you're unmuted and you want to speak, feel free to unmute yourself, um, as well as uh, keep an eye on the group chat. There will be little comments here and there. And we want this to be very interactive, so don't hesitate to share anything in the group chat. Um, and we'll also be sending a post forum survey. So it'd be great if you could write down your email address as well. Um, and I think everyone has done this already, but we love seeing where everyone's calling from. So if you could just put your city down as well. Um, and my name is Julene. So if at any point during the forum you have some technical challenges, feel free to directly message me through that chat feature. Um, and yeah, I'm excited. Sorry to jump in there, but continue. <laughs> oh, that's good to know. Thank you. <laughs> Julene is our technical goddess whenever there's an issue. <laughs> the person I call upon. <laughs> so, oh, let me pull up the right form. Here we go. But yeah, I was actually really excited to see um, kind of this sudden change almost. Um, that SeaWorld is going to be trying, even if they're changing the shows, I, I imagine it's very difficult to just suddenly go, our most like popular attraction is gone. Um, but trying to emphasize the natural behavior can also lead to me, to people questioning, okay, why do whales do that? And that's a good education opportunity right there. So even though it might not be what, uh, activists truly want and that's the complete stopping of the video of the shows um, I think it's definitely a step in the right direction for sure so I'm glad about that um, I'm gonna jump to one of the questions that was submitted um, the question was concerning the Great Pacific garbage patch and how great is it actually um, and I'm going to read her little quote because I thought that was the funniest thing. I can't imagine it being a giant island consisting solely of plastic bottles, plastic bags, and plastic toys. And that's actually the part that is, to me, the, that most people kind of mythicize. Um, it's not really mostly big pieces of plastic. Um, it's actually microplastics that have been degraded either through um, the sun, it's called federal degradation, or through the fact that it's in a giant current and they break apart. 
And these small plastics are actually more dangerous than the big ones because uh, things end up eating them and not realizing. And you always see kind of the pictures of seabirds and they have big pieces of plastic or sea turtles. But what you need to realize is the small fish are going to eat the small plastic and then the bigger species are going to eat the small fish and then the bigger species are going to eat those. And it's kind of that, um, like mass effect. Um, and they also wanted to know how big is the great Pacific garbage patch actually. And I admittedly did not know this. It is actually the combination of two garbage patches, um, one on off of kind of the coast of California slash Hawaii, and another that's on the other side, and that is off the coast of Japan. And together they form a what they call the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. But we actually don't know how big it really is. Um, mostly because it's the ocean and it moves. Uh, there are currents that take things very, very far away. So something that you accidentally put in the ocean in California could end up in Japan or it could end up like in Hawaii or somewhere super far away. Um, and the other problem that scientists are actually trying to work on right now is the depth. You can actually find plastic several meters below the water so even if they just kind of took a survey of the top to see how big it was, you also have to account for the volume. So how much below the ocean is this uh, plastic and garbage really going? So it is thought to be twice the size of Texas, although it is most likely larger than that because of this movement of uh, flows. So let me see if I can do the share screen. Boop, boop. Let's see. Uh, here we go. Uh, so everyone should hopefully be able to see this graphic if I did it right. Yes. Okay. So this, perfect. I got really nervous there, guys. This is um, the currents of the ocean, just some of them. So really, hypothetically, if we look at where I am, which is in New York, so on the east side, um, something that I put into the ocean could hypothetically end on the other side of the world, which is crazy, thousands of miles away. One thing that I put in, it's not going to necessarily stay where I put it. Um, but if you look at this big circular piece on the west coast of the United States, this big kind of circle is where the Great Pacific Garbage Patch would be located. Um, and it's just kind of one of those big problems that if we are throwing things into the ocean, it's not going it to, not, it's not necessarily going to directly affect us. It might affect someone in a completely different part of the world that would never think to throw something in the in the water as a means of disposal um so that's kind of like my bit of food for thought there and like i said i feel exceptionally bad because i'm currently drinking out of a plastic bottle i will recycle this though okay. let it be known uh, so who's basically accountable like how to, because it moves around it's not specific to one location who who decides who gets to clean it up that is one of the biggest debated problems because a lot of times you can't actually tell where things come from, except for in the very off chance that um, it's a cargo container, which occasionally does happen. Uh, one of my favorite stories is a cargo container entirely of rubber ducks fell into the ocean and they were actually able to track ocean currents based on where these rubber ducks were found. Um, it's unfortunately really hard to place blame because of the currents. Um, and one of the big problems is usually people are not too lazy, but just don't care enough to actually place the blame anywhere. So it's not a big enough problem yet where someone has to, has to like finally step up and clean it. Well, 
think for the real world. It like hurts their, their like their nation or something. Yeah. Um, it really doesn't have enough of a, an effect on, um, not people who, who care. This is very interesting for people who study the environment, for people who study waste management, for people who study marine ecosystems, but really until it has an effect on maybe business or Wall Street somehow, I don't know how popular it's going to really become um, to try to find a way to solve these problems. And it's not as easy as just kind of going in and like, if your room is dirty, you go and you pick stuff up and clean it. Fortunately, the ocean is not like your room. It is not easy to just go and sweep it clean or to go in and physically pick up everything. Cause like I said, the plastics, um, after not that long become so small that they're pretty much invisible, but it still is super harmful to both the marine mammals and the water itself and kind of the whole ecosystem. So, but there are technologies that are trying to work through. Um, most notably, I'm going to try to share this video. Let me see how. I think that this is kind of one of the coolest things that I've seen. Share screen. Okay. This should hopefully be playing. Is it playing, the video? Is the video playing? Yes, no? Cool. <laughs> this is a plastic-free water bottle called Uho or Uhu. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. It is a seaweed derived membrane. So you hold it in your hand and you like puncture it and you slurp out the water and then you can eat the membrane, but you can also hypothetically throw it away because it's entirely organic. Um, this is Obviously not popular yet because it's weird. I'm not going to lie. I truly can't think of myself kind of like in the middle of class, like, oh, I'm really thirsty. That, that, would be, that would be a little weird. But Also, couldn't that break very easily? Like if you want to carry it with you? That's the other thing that people are saying is, is you, with a water bottle, you can throw it in your backpack and it will probably last. But because it's such a thin organic membrane, um, this kind of biodegradable water bottle might not hold up. So. Then they can't make water bottles out of this material? Like regular water bottles out of yeah. this material? Right now, I think that they are trying to market this as an alternative for people who don't normally drink from the tap or from glasses in their, like, daily lives. So let's say you're at your desk or um, even you're in your dorm room and you don't want to drink from the tap. That's kind of how they're marketing it right now because I truly can't see someone being in a rush or on the go and being like, oh, let me grab my Uhu and throw it in my backpack. Unless, like, if you have a laptop in there, that's not good. But it's, they're, they, it's an edible water balloon, kind of. It's an edible water balloon. Um, but it is a kind of a very, very cheap way of trying to solve this big water bottle plastic. So each balloon, each uhu, uho costs about two cents to make. Which if you think about how much money goes into creating plastics and unfortunately how little return there is, both in uh, economical and recycling, the uhu might be the future of drinking from water bottles or water balloons. <laughs> water balloons. Um, and it's actually 
becoming, uh, it won a couple of design awards and that's where it got a lot of its funding. And I believe that they also um, won the Lexus Design Award, which is kind of a, like, for designs, it's a really big deal. And I think it was the first ever kind of environmental-minded design to win this award, which is really cool. So who knows? We might have just seen the future of solving the plastic garbage patch. I don't know. Um, does anyone have any other questions or comments about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Or Uhu, Uho, who knows how to pronounce it? I don't. Does the plastic like leach out any chemicals? I know they're, they're very small, they can get into everything, but like, do they change the chemistry of the water? Yes, they change the chemistry of the water and they also can change the actual geography of the bottom. Um, I'm sure we're, mo we're mostly girls over here. Um, and guys, the microbeads in the face washes, those are being banned across the board because they're actually changing the sediment uh, of the bottoms of different water bodies. Uh, they're, they're, they're so small, but there's so many of them that they're seeing a rise. And that means that the sea levels rise too. And because they're so small, um, species eat them. And so the one concern, it's kind of a very weird concern. If the plastic is too big, a species can eat it and either choke or it can get that sensation of being full, but it actually isn't full because it, it's not eating anything of nutritional value. But when it's so small, it accumulates and that can be harmful to them and when they're still alive and if they get eaten by a larger species or by their um, predator, by a predator, it has that kind of bioaccumulation effect. So there's no good size for it, but they do see that um, if the plastic is colored, um, if it has, if it's a toy, sometimes toys have additional parts. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes lead is a popular component of toys still from outside of America, sometimes even Amer in America. They do see it can change the water chemistry. And if we're seeing it with such small amounts, and I use that term very loosely, what happens in 10 or 20 years when we continue to put more and more plastics in the water, so. Mm -hmm. Isn't it possible that people are eating plastic at this yeah. point, like, because it's in the fish, so we are eating them? Yeah, we're, we're definitely eating plastic, uh, which is pretty gross. Um, yeah. Even if you think about uh, the fact that we put a lot of our foods in plastic containers, like, I, I, I don't know how true this is but like my mother would always be like don't microwave your plastics because in her mind something happened to the plastics and either something would leach into my food or like bits of plastic would break off but pretty much everything that happens in our environment comes back to us in one way or another uh and unfortunately we're so ingrained in plastics that we're we're eating them too we're eating the things that eat the plastic, so. What row? No fun. No fun. So, let's see. Boop, boop. Uh, there was something else. Let me see if I can pull it up. Oh, here we go. They also are finding um, that these plastics are harming the, 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 the vegetation of the ocean because there are so many tiny little pieces of plastic that it's actually making the water cloudier. And that means that not enough sun is getting in and these plants that are so used to a certain amount of sun aren't getting it. And this can also cause a whole nother kind of 
ecosystem collapse because if there's no plants, the fish that feed on the plants can't live, so they die out. So these plastics are affecting the ocean's ecosystem from like every single layer from the from us it's affecting us to the chemistry of the water the vegetation the mammals the different fish um and it's kind of it's a really big deal but not a lot of people seem to think it's a big enough problem yet so like in everyone's or in, if anyone wants to say in your opinion what how bad do you think it needs to get before kind of someone with more power or more standing can do something about it like how bad does it need to get um i mean it really is bad so i think it's just a matter of educating people about how bad it is because like when people heard that you know fukushima blew up and then there was all those chemicals in the water. Well, this is kind of the same issue, except people hear radioactive and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, it's so bad. But like, people need to be educated that this is bad too, because this is, because plastics really are another chemical. So if you say chemical, sometimes people get really, really bent out of shape. So maybe we should use that word a little bit more. It's all about education because if people don't hear about it and they don't know about it, like there's no way that they're going to know that there are these garbage patches or anything like that going on in the ocean because we can't see it. And for a lot of people, they need to see it in order to believe it really. So education, totally. I agree. I agree. Do you think that we're not using the word chemicals to kind of not necessarily protect the public, but to keep them at ease because plastics are such a big part of our world our economy like i i like to consider myself environmental but i can see on my desk at least 50 different plastic things right now and i can't there's no way i could stop it unless i want to write with a quill and like some ink one day well i mean it's not about i don't think it's about not using plastic at all because it really i mean like you said it really does like run our economy i think that if you get to the public and people stop littering and people are a little bit more conscientious about how they deal with their garbage and even about local um, local governments or whatever, about um, how they deal with their garbage collection, where they're putting it and uh, recycling, of course, how we can get people to be on more board with recycling and so less plastic garbage goes into the actual garbage it goes to a recycling plant so it really i really think that this is a everybody's issue and everybody needs to make a difference like this is one of those things where everybody needs to do it so it, it really is an education thing and but i don't think that you have to completely annihilate plastics like it's kind of a we can have our cake and eat it too a little bit we just really need to be not so apathetic about everything I, I 100, I could not say it better myself. I, I agree. Um, people, if you scare people too much, they kind of shut down. Like they don't think they can do anything anymore. So like there has to be a certain level of optimism and how they can change it. But it has to be like visible change. People are very visual. Like it's like this weird situation. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, I, I know when I used to do uh, marine education at Riverhead Aquarium, um, it was all very positive, you know, like you can make a difference. And if you make this difference, it will make a difference and just let them know that as long as they're doing this and they're doing the right thing, that it will event, it will show, it will be fruitful and it will be if, but everyone's got to do it. It's kind of like that, but you can be optimistic about it. It's not like, Oh, like there's nothing we can do. You know, don't, don't say that. Yeah, it's hard to distance between like the, the immediate problem and you. <laughs> it's like, but um, I feel like also if if uh, we consume enough plastic and becomes like a like a legit health issue, then it probably increases like insurance rates, and then that will probably like lead policy change. Like it always has to like happen on such a catastrophic. Well, at least how a lot of things get changed has to happen in a very big way. It's not like a slow, gradual. You gotta hit them in the pocketbook. Yeah, That's what you really gotta do. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's going to be a very interesting kind of future going uh, to see 
especially because we see places banning plastic bags. Um, we see a lot of very, a slow movement towards um, a switch over to less plastic. So I am very excited to introduce Dr. Bond, Dr. Mark Bond, onto our lovely meeting here. Thank you again so much for being here. I know that we're all really, really, really excited to have you here. So I just want to make sure. Uh, okay, hold on. Let me... I just want to get him sound. It's having a couple of technical difficulties. Let's see. Just want to make sure he can hear us. If he's able to hear us, but mm -hmm. we can't hear him. Um, what he might want to do is sign out and then rejoin and make sure to click join by compu uh, computer audio. He can't hear us. Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to... Um, trying it might to be best to just... Yes, join out. audio, but nothing happened. Mm -hmm. uh, try signing out and back. Aha, uh -huh. there you go. Oh, ha, ha. Hello. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Hi, how's everyone going? Good, good. Thank you again so much for being here. Oh, uh, no problem. Sorry I was a bit late. I'm at a conference in Panama right now, and the, uh, the last talk overran. All good, all good. All right, so let's jump right in. Let's start with a bit of background. Can you tell us where you grew up, uh, where you studied, and where you work now? Okay, sure. So um, I grew up in Cape Town in South Africa, uh, right at the bottom. Uh, it's a beautiful spot because it's separated by both the Atlantic Ocean and also the Indian Ocean on the other side. Uh, so we have a lot of diversity in the oceans there. Uh, I did my undergraduate degree at Cardiff University, which is in Wales in the UK. And then um, I'm currently working at Florida International University down in Miami. Very cool. So your research is centered around sharks. What kind of first attracted you to study them? So uh, South Africa obviously is known for its white shark population. And uh, I was a keen surfer when I was growing up and as was my father. And so we always kind of saw sharks in the media basically when people were getting attacked. And so I think most boys want to study sea creatures or monsters and dinosaurs and things like that. And obviously we don't have dinosaurs anymore. So sharks are the next best thing. Cool. And then after that, I was able to go to uh, Bimini in the Bahamas. And uh, that's kind of where I learned to do most of the research. Um, and that was my first kind of break into the research world. And then everything went from there. Very neat. So all of us at 10 by 20, we're about promoting sustainable development goal number 14, which is, to conserve and protect our marine resources. And we want to bring awareness to marine protected areas and kind of how they go to this fulfillment of SDG 14. In your opinion, what makes marine protected areas such a great tool in the conservation of oceans and its biodiversity? That is a good question. Um, so actually the kind of marine protected areas, in my opinion, are a great idea, but they're still not widely accepted by the broader scientific community as being the best solution to all of our problems. Um, I think the strength, from, uh, the strength for marine reserves is the fact that it's an area where we can stop or prevent any human activities from disturbing the ecosystem. So ecosystems are incredibly sensitive, especially in the marine world, because they're so heavily connected. Um, and so just to have an area where we don't have any fishing, because fishing is one of the main things that we're seeing that's causing damage to the marine environment. Also no development, so we're not dredging up mangroves and things like that, and also no oil and gas extraction. So just to have a little pocket of security is a great thing. Um, we know that they work really, really well for slow-moving or sedentary species, such as lobster, conch. So from a fisheries management perspective, they're great because... They can be these little pockets where those species can benefit and then spill over and actually help the fishery as well as being a, 
a conservation of biodiversity hotspot. Um, but we don't really know how well they work for things that can move large distances, such as sharks and stingrays. So a lot of the research that I'm doing now is trying to dictate or trying to determine whether or not marine reserves are an effective tool for the conservation of sharks and rays. And is it species specific or could we use this as a widespread approach? How big do marine reserves need to be for sharks and ray conservation? Uh, do they need to be in certain habitats? Do we only conserve coral reefs or do we conserve the pelagic or the deep water environment? So these are, these are questions that we have to answer before we can conclusively say, yes, they are a great tool for shark and ray conservation, but they definitely seem to benefit the marine ecosystem as a whole if we're kind of looking at it as a broader picture and not specifically for sharks and rays. Yeah. So why are sharks so important to the ocean's ecosystem? So most sharks uh, actually sit relatively high in the food chain. So if you think about a food web as a, as a pyramid, then the shark would sit right at the top there. Um, we term that in ecology as an apex predator. So a lot of the theory behind this is that sharks, as these either high trophic level predators or apex predators right at the top, they control the health of the marine ecosystem through top-down pressure. So as the predator that doesn't have any that isn't prey for anything else or it isn't preyed upon by anything else. They kind of structure the marine ecosystem in, in a term called top down. So they can remove sick individuals, so sick fish and things like that. And they also can kind of maintain the balance. So say for example, in coral reefs, if you don't have a lot of sharks or, or one of the theories is if you remove sharks from coral reef environments, then the next trophic level down, such as your large body pisobores, your groupers, your barracudas, then they get uh, their, their populations increase and then they fall, put a greater, um, greater predation pressure on their prey. And their prey can be herbivores such as parrots, so uh, parrot fish even, not parrots. Um, and so if you have an explosion or an increase in numbers of pisobores and you reduce your parrot fish or your herbivore population, then you can reduce the grazing potential and we might see a shift from a coral dominated ecosystem to an algae dominated ecosystem. And obviously we rely on coral reefs as a as hotspot for biodiversity, both from an ecological and an economical point of view. So we need to really preserve these environments. And one of the things that we're trying to do now is to determine, is this assumption true? Do we need sharks for healthy coral reef ecosystems or do they kind of act together with a, alongside these other big species, therefore, we can reduce the numbers of sharks without seeing this trophic cascade, this knock-on effect of removing one element to the food web. Yeah. So, okay. A lot of my friends personally are like really, really scared of sharks. Why do you think the media seems to portray sharks as these kind of crazy monsters, man-eating beasts of the sea? Uh, unfortunately, I think it seems to be the case that bad news travels faster and further than good news. Um, and so one of the main things we only really hear about sharks, or up until recently, I would say that broader public perception is changing in certain areas, um, thanks to a lot of the good outwork and education. But I think because mainly people hear about sharks when sharks have attacked humans, and we're not comfortable in the marine environment compared to what we are on land. We know we can get in a car and drive away from a lion. But when we're in the sea, we're kind of exposed. And so we probably feel quite vulnerable. And movies like Jaws didn't help um, because obviously they portrayed sharks as bloodthirsty killers. But if sharks were, then I wouldn't be here because uh, I would have been taken out years ago. <laughs> so what are the biggest threats against sharks right now? Uh, that is a good question. So uh, it would have to be fishing pressure. Unfortunately, sharks are different from, so sharks are cartilaginous fish, mm -hmm. and most fish that we perceive or that we think of when we think of a fish are bony fish. So bony fish and sharks and stingrays and, and chimeras and skates, they all have a very different uh, life history. So they're kind of like us. They're slow to reach sexual maturity. They grow slowly. They have low number of offspring, um, and therefore, if we fish them or if we put them under intense fish and pressure, they're extremely vulnerable to overexploitation and their populations don't rebound. So when a fish reproduces, obviously it spawns in the water and you can have 
sometimes up to hundreds of thousands of little fry that come out of one spawning event. Whereas sharks are like us, so they have internal fertilization and they need to put a lot more energetic investment into reproduction itself. Therefore, their pups come out and instead of being these tiny little things that can get wiped out by a lot of predators, they're kind of well-formed uh, individuals that can kind of adapt to their environment faster, but it does make them susceptible to fishing pressure. So we've got fishing pressure that's intentional. So people that are going out there to target sharks, uh, the meat is consumed around the world in a lot of countries, but obviously the high value item is the shark fins. Um, and that is consumed primarily in Asia through the shark fin soup. But we are seeing again, a kind of, a change in the public perception as to why people want to eat shark fin soup in Asia. So hopefully we can reduce the demand and therefore reduce the targeted fishing for sharks in that respect. But sharks are also taken in huge quantities as bycatch. So you can have a trawl, you can have a, a fish aggregating device that's set up so that people can fish for tuna, but the sharks just like the tuna aggregate around it. Um, and you can have bycatch that can also reduce a lot the numbers of sharks at incredible rates. Wow. And in fact, in addition, in addition to fishing pressure, we also have um, critical habitat loss. So we know through climate change and through human development, marine pollution, that we're losing a lot of our coral reefs. Uh, we're also doing a lot of coastal development, so dredging up mangroves to build sea resorts and coastal wall, uh, uh, sea walls and retaining walls and things like that. So mangroves are, for some species of shark, critical nursery habitat. So if we remove those, then the babies don't have a safe environment to, to grow up in, uh, and therefore the population is impacted. Wow. There's a lot of things working against them right now. Yeah, I know. Poor sharks. And they also eat themselves. So uh, <laughs> there's high rates of cannibalism within sharks. So they really do have a tough life. Oh, my gosh. So in your research, you use baited remote underwater video. Can you explain that to us and kind of how it benefits your research? Sure. So uh, baited remote underwater video, or uh, brubs as we call them, um, are essentially a camera in a waterproof housing that goes down. It's attached to a frame, uh, which could be metal or PVC. And in front of the camera is an arm that contains bait. So the idea being that we set these on the seafloor in a nice kind of flat habitat. We don't want to put them on any coral and damage that sort of thing. So we scope out a nice kind of flat sandy bottom. Uh, we set these things down and we orient the camera with the current. So anything that smells the chum slick or the smell of the bait will follow that smell up the odor corridor and then eventually get filmed on camera. So it's very comparable to camera traps that they use for big cats in the jungles and also up in the, the Himalayas and things like that. And I think the strength of, of brubs is they're easily scalable. So you can put them in pretty much any environment except for really poor visibility. They're not so great. Um, they're much more cost effective. Once you get the gear together, um, you don't really have any cost besides uh, boat and, and gas money. Um, and therefore, it's different from fishing gear where you have to replace hooks and damage gear from catching sharks. Uh, and the cool thing about them is that it allows us through the video to catch a lot of data without actually having to catch the shark. So we're, they're perfect for employing in areas where we don't want to damage the ecosystem, like marine reserves, for example. Um, and the video is an incredibly strong tool because not everyone's fortunate enough to be able to go into the marine environment and see what's down there themselves. And so by being able to take that video to areas and show school kids or people that don't go out to the islands where the coral is, show them what they have and, and give that kind of sense of, of pride. Um, and that goes a long way into kind of educating and making the public aware of things and hopefully generating support. Yeah, I've seen some of the videos and I will show one um, in a bit, but it's, it's awesome. It's so cool. I want to see it like on a big screen IMAX. <laughs> so we actually have a, we're actually at the very beginning of a very exciting project called Global Finprint. Mm. And uh, it's going to be the first global assessment of reef shark abundance using a standardized gear. So we're going to use these baited remote underwater videos and we're going to target a minimum of 400 reefs around the world, yeah. focusing on coral reefs. And we're going to generate these indexes of relative abundance. Um, and that will show us that will go a long way into answering these questions. Do marine reserves benefit sharks? Do we see 
higher numbers of species of sharks inside marine reserves compared to fish reefs? If so, what species? Uh, do we have large uh, species that can move great distances such as hammerheads or tiger sharks? Do they benefit from marine reserves? We're also going to try and answer that question. What happens in situations where we have removed the sharks? How does it affect the ecosystem? Do we see these trophic cascades that are hypothesized? Uh, or are ecosystems able to adapt to the loss of top predators and things like that? And so this project will be rolled out over the next uh, three years. Um, it's from a grant from the Paul Allen um, Foundation. And uh, we're going to hopefully have a big uh, website up and running very soon and it will allow citizen scientists to get involved so that you can log on you can review the videos and enter the data themselves and send it back to us so we're hoping through that outreach and citizen science proponent that will also generate support for shark conservation worldwide that is so cool i admit i've been on the global fin print that's where i was looking at the broad videos and it looks amazing yeah, I know. It's very Absolutely. exciting. We've started Absolutely. sampling in the last couple of, uh, we've started the new sampling in the last couple of um, uh, months. And I've been speaking to a lot of representatives from the Caribbean now at this meeting. And there seems to be a lot of support for the project. So it's, uh, yeah, very exciting. That's so cool. And I see you've gotten to travel all over the world. Uh, your research takes you all over. So where was your favorite place to travel? Uh, yeah. Uh, Oh yeah, it's tough because everywhere has a different, uh, every, everywhere has something positive that you love about it. But I would say overall it would be the Bahamas uh, just because it's the first place where I ever did extensive shark research um, thanks to a gillnet and longline ban that the Bahamian government put in place in the early 90s. The Bahamas shark populations are doing really, really well. Um, there's incredible diversity in the number of species there. I think they have 50 species of sharks within right. the Bahamas that we know of right now. Um, and it's one of the few places where you can actually go and interact with sharks regularly because unfortunately, as we've already discussed, that they're, they're taking a hit globally. So the Bahamas is almost like a lifeboat for a lot of shark species. And in 2011, the Bahamas implemented uh, a shark sanctuary so it closed its exclusive economic zone to shark fishing, um, commercial shark fishing. So it's now illegal to possess or trade shark products. And we think this will go a long way to making sure that the Bahamas stays the way it is, which has been so successful because of the long lines and the gill nets. And uh, as well as the sharks, we have uh, small tooth sawfish in some of the islands in the Bahamas. So that's one of my other favorite species to work with. And just as sharks are taking a big hit globally, we think... Or, or the scientists believe that we might lose up to a quarter of shark and, and ray species in the next few decades. So stingrays need, uh, stingrays need our attention as much as sharks. But small tooth sawfish are probably the, uh, or sawfishes in general, are the most critically endangered right now. So to have an area like the Bahamas where you don't have gill nets and you don't have long lines and you still find small tooth sawfish is, is great. Um, we're working hopefully with the government shortly to try and increase uh, protective legislation for, sawtooth, uh, for small tooth sawfish in the Bahamas. Uh, and yeah, it's just, I love the place. It's like, going, it's like going home. I'm very excited when I get to go on a boat and go back to the Bahamas. Oh my gosh, it sounds, it sounds amazing. It sounds like paradise. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, there's some pretty special places there, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so what has been your favorite moment either during your research or um, in the field or even when you were a student? Um, well, these are good questions. Uh, I would say I really enjoy the outreach side of things. So going to schools in the Bahamas or Myanmar and South Africa and presenting shark research and, and showing people kind of the benefits of them and why Bahamians should be so proud that they have the shark sanctuary. But from a completely personal point of view, I would say uh, – Swimming with oceanic white tips is, is probably one of my highlights, just because unfortunately they're one of the species that has taken a really, really bad hit over the last couple of uh, decades. And you don't find them with regularity pretty much anywhere except the Bahamas and Hawaii. There are mixed reports from a couple of places around the world, but the Bahamas is the one place where you can regularly get to interact with them. And they're, uh, they're really big sharks. They're incredibly... Uh, incredibly goofy looking with these giant peck fins and uh, you get to dive with them in the clear clear blue water with no uh, you can't even see the bottom you're in thousands of meters deep so it's uh, yeah it's a pretty exciting experience so everyone 
involved in this 10 by 20 20 campaign is really passionate about conserving the oceans. If you could give us one or two kind of messages to pass on with friends and family, what would it be? Um, I think it's just education and awareness. Um, like you've already touched on, a lot of people see sharks as these big killing machines and therefore they're not particularly worried when they see that we are fishing them out on such a huge scale globally. But uh, we need to understand what their role is in the ecosystem. And although it seems like an almost immanageable task, it's very easy as one individual person to make a difference. You could go to schools and make a presentation or you could sign up to support research or get involved, speak to your local um, ministers or government and try and increase protection for sharks. I know a lot of the states in the US have had uh, shark fin bans recently, so you can't get this trade in shark fins. Um, so just as us as individuals, we can still make a difference. We shouldn't be overwhelmed by the scale of the problem. And so I would say education and awareness is, is one of the keys to making this, to making progress in this battle. Awesome. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Uh, definitely education and awareness, because if you follow what you see on the TV, you would think sharks are only there to attack you or to yeah, exactly. hurt you. <laughs> All right, I have some questions that were submitted in. Okay. How are sharks influenced by changing sea temperatures? Wow, so again, that's uh, actually something I was just talking about downstairs in the, uh, in the conference. So we don't really know. Uh, we know that this could impact their prey because fish seem to be equally uh, intolerant of changes in sea surface temperatures that we're seeing with climate change. Um, we've had cases of two different species of sharks that were separated because they each preferred different temperature, temperature waters. But because of climate change, their habitats have now overlapped and we've seen a hybrid species. So there's two types of black tips in Australia and they've now reproduced together and have created a, a new species of shark, a hybrid of the two. So that's one mm -hmm. example that you can think of right off the top of the head, but also Changes in sea surface temperature and ocean acidification as a result of climate change is going to heavily impact our, um, our coral reef environment. Uh, most of our shark species are found over coral reefs or coral reefs are extremely important to their prey. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, damage to coral as we speak right now. We're in one of the worst El Ninos uh, that we're going to have seen since probably 1998. So we're going to see a lot of change through that. and. Uh, we still need to put a lot of research efforts into figuring out what are actually going to be the consequences of climate change. Obviously, rising sea levels could increase shark habitat, but that's probably one of the least, least things that we're going to have to worry about. We really need to worry about the temperature and the, uh, the pH, the ocean acidification. Yeah. And then another question we got was, why shark fins? What, what seems to be, why are they so popular? So it goes back into uh, Asian uh, cultural heritage. So back in the Ming dynasty, um, the emperor believed that he embodied the spirit of whatever he consumed. And so uh, sharks were obviously seen as kind of the top predators in the ocean, the fearsome warriors. And one of the things that's most signature about sharks is their teeth and their fins. And uh, you wouldn't really enjoy eating shark teeth. So shark fins seem to be the next best option. And uh, so that was kind of where this mystique around shark fin soup came from. And it was only ever revered or, or consumed by the wealthy because it was extremely expensive. So therefore, it became a status symbol. So just like driving a Mercedes Benz, only the top class people could access it. And so as you had a growing economy, as the uh, Asian markets improved, and more people became wealthy, they wanted to show off their wealth and they wanted to live this lavish lifestyle. So shark fin soup was consumed on a broader scale. Uh, it's often held at um, weddings. The Chinese government have actually just put in austerity measures. So they've stopped shark fin soup being held at any formal government functions. So that's been hugely, uh, huge yeah. win for the conservation efforts there. And hopefully they'll continue that. Um, but yeah, it's still, it's still a big problem. Over 100 million sharks are killed every year. And uh, we've learned about their reproduction and we know that they can't sustain this fishing pressure. So if we, reduce the, if we reduce the fin market and we reduce the demand and uh, the cost of fins, then people won't see it as this easy way to make money because 
right now shark fins can be extremely expensive you can get like hammerhead fins can go for up to 600 800 dollars and uh, so it's almost like as much money as drugs and so we're seeing cartels i was just speaking to a guy from costa rica now and he said that a lot of the cartels and the mobs are involved in shark fin trading um because there's such huge profit margins and it's not you don't have sniffer dogs for shark fins like you do for cocaine or other things that they can make money off. Uh, we are seeing some progress with respect to that. So obviously the big demand would be the shark fins themselves and through um, legislation such as CITES, which is the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species. We've had success at the last meeting with uh, three species of hammerheads, poor beagle and oceanic white tip. Um, joining Appendix 2, which means that you're not allowed to trade those fins. Uh, so hopefully that will eventually reduce the, um, reduce the amount of those particular species in the trade itself. And hopefully we'll be able to list some more shark and ray species in the near future and keep that momentum going. So hopefully if we reduce the demand, then we won't need to have the supply and we'll hopefully have people putting less pressure on sharks for their fins. Wow. There's like a shark fin mafia. Yeah, I know. Really, that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty good way of putting it. <laughs> that's crazy. All right, last question. So, does human interaction hurt the sharks in any way? We know that with some fi fish species, uh, touching their skin can be harmful to their immune system. Is it the same with sharks? Uh, so we don't know what it is from the immune system. So uh, basically, whoever sent in that question was kind of alluding to the fact that some fish have this mucus on them and this mucus coating is uh, what keeps them protected from germs and things like that because mm -hmm. the ocean has a ton of bacteria in it. Um, and so that is not quite the same for sharks. Sharks have very, very tough skin. It's almost, it's been used as leather and sandpaper in the past. Um, it's incredibly resilient to bacteria. You don't see sharks that have uh, fouling on them. So you never see sharks with barnacles like you do with whales. They never have algae growing off them like sea turtle shells and things like that. Um, and that's to do with the structure of the dermal denticles on the shark itself. So it's almost like you have thousands and thousands of fingernails laid on top of each other. So it's not one continuous surface. It's just lots and lots of little bits. So we call those dermal denticles. And that kind of gives the shark skin this strength and this kind of uh, ability to not have things foul on it. So touching sharks wouldn't be dangerous from a biological standpoint, as in bacteria and infections, but it shouldn't be done just because we shouldn't be harassing animals in their natural environment. Um, if we were walking down the street and someone ran and jumped on your back, you'd be a little bit upset. So it's obviously not a good, uh, it's not a good way to do anything is to kind of harass it in its own environment. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we do see some, uh, some people on TV kind of glorifying it from a, a macho standpoint, but anyone that's in the, anyone that's in the conservation business and that wants to see good, solid ecotourism and, and good conservation progress shouldn't really be touching sharks. Uh, there are examples such as little baby nurse sharks that you can have in a touch tank and with limited interaction, that would be fine. And it would go a long way from an educational point of view, but I wouldn't be recommending anybody going into the, uh, the natural environment, grabbing hold of sharks or touching them or pulling on their tails because if you end up getting bitten, that's pretty much your fault. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time out of a really busy schedule to talk to us, to kind of give us this insight into not only sharks all over the world, but how marine reserves and marine protected areas can actually be beneficial to that species. So thank you again so much. No problem. You're very welcome. And thanks everybody for, uh, for caring about this subject matter because uh, it's obviously very close to my heart and hopefully we'll continue the good progress that's already being made. Definitely. Uh, later on, on to our Facebook page, I will share the global fin print. Uh, uh, that would be excellent. And like I say, I'll, uh, I'll stay in contact with you. And then when we have the citizen science website up and running, then you can use that as an avenue to get it up. Definitely. Thank you again so, so much. No problem. And if anybody's interested in getting involved in FinPrint from uh, a research, maybe I don't know how broad of an audience we're, uh, we're talking to geographically right now, but we're looking for people to collaborate. If you know, if you have the ability to go out and set these cameras and you or you know fishermen that would be willing to cooperate or dive, uh, dive operators and things like that, this isn't exclusive to scientists. 
we're happy to uh, to supply the gear and to give the training so that people can help with us because we're not able to go around the world all by ourselves and get this project achieved. We need good collaborative spirit. So if people know of anyone or want to find out more from an actual field work point of view, then uh, please reach out to us. Definitely. I will, I will pass along anyone who's interested. Great. Excellent. Well, enjoy the rest of your uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. Bye. All right. So let me pull this up. So cool. That was crazy. All right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. So this is one of the things he mentioned, um, the BRUV. Let's see. And um, this is one from the, actually, the Global Finprint Vimeo. And it's the Bahamas Shark Sanctuary. So like he said, this is um, a three year long project that is happening all over the world um, to kind of get as many, as much information of sharks and stingrays and other cartilaginous um, marine species. So if anyone knows anyone or them themselves want to participate, if you shoot me an email, Facebook message, I can definitely pass along that information. Like he said, they will give you directions on how to do it. They send you all the supplies. As you can see, it's like a beautifully simple, it's a camera with like a giant long stick and then you put some bait in and you let the sharks come. Like that, that is, it's the simplicity that's beautiful. Um, I'm so, 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 so happy that he got to sign on. Like I said, he was in Panama at a conference, so he's probably tired and jet lagged, um, but he is absolutely fantastic. And the work that he and his team does is really so important, um, both from a conservation of biodiversity point of view, and also really bringing that education awareness that sharks aren't these crazy man-eating beasts that solely exist to leap out of the water and like eat you whole. Um, and it's very true that I honestly was scared of sharks for a little bit there. I saw Jaws and I thought that I was going to go into the water and if I had like a little paper cut on my finger, I was going to get eaten by a shark. And it wasn't until I really confronted that fear and read books on sharks and really watched like National Geographic on sharks uh, that I realized the media was kind of skewing what we thought, what we really should be thinking about sharks. So myth debunked. Very happy about that. Um, I'm going to move on to another question that someone had, which I'm really, really, really excited for. So they asked me what, how come mermaids are a thing? Like what, what, 
why mermaids? What, why mermaids? And I am, I cannot even tell you how in love I am with this question. So it is National Manatee Month. And manatees are actually thought to be um, the origin of mermaids. So if you've ever seen a picture of a manatee, one, they're adorable. They're the sea, they're called sea cows. Um, they also are closely related to dugongs, which look exactly like them, but have some little biological differences. And it is thought that people who were on boats um, would get either dehydrated or maybe a little like stir crazy and would see manatees as these beautiful kind of women of the ocean. Um, if you look at a picture of a manatee, it has that flipper that kind of is very well associated with manatees. Um, they don't look anything like humans to me, but I'm sure if you've been on a boat for like a year and a half and maybe dehydrated, maybe suffering from some scurvy, maybe you haven't seen anyone aside from your crew for quite some time, you might think that a manatee was a mermaid. Um, so it is a little bit of a mythology, but um, fun fact, Christopher Columbus had a mermaid sighting of his own which actually ended up being the first account of manatees in North America. So he thought that a manatee was a mermaid, when in actuality, it was a very cute sea cow. Uh, probably made him feel a little bit silly after the fact, but you know. And it is national, like I said, National Manatee Month. Um, manatees, personally, are my favorite animal. I have a lot of manatee paraphernalia. Um, and they are actually one of the most endangered marine species in the United States. Um, manatee deaths hit an all-time high in 2013, which um, was about 829 killed in Florida alone. That's about 17% of the known population. Um, contrary to a lot of belief, Actually, the majority of them were killed by algae blooms. So a lot of people think, oh, boat collisions or um, some crazy, like, Floridian tourist trying to ride a manatee, which, true story, did happen, and she did get arrested. I wish it was me sometimes. But it was actually caused by algae blooms, um, which are sometimes naturally occurring, but more often than not are actually caused by chemicals that we put into our environments. Um, most notably for me is pesticides uh, and fertilizers. Kind of that increase in nitrogen can cause these harmful algal blooms or HABs. Uh, it's a really big deal for, uh, in my area on Long Island, we have some really bad algal blooms that not only affect our ecosystems, but also affect our drinking water, which is kind of a big thing because all of our drinking water comes from the ground. And if our drinking water is poisoned, oh, that's not gonna be good. But um, all three species of manatees are listed on the International Union for the Conservation of nature because they are so susceptible to extinction um, and there is a lot of it's kind of a different problem than sharks where sharks people see them as these big man-eating creatures a lot of people think manatees are really cute I do um, and there is kind of a lot of information especially in Florida because it's that whole ecotourism thing but we're still seeing this decrease, um, mostly because of uh, the, the harmful algal blooms, um, the loss of their habitats. They live in estuaries, which are very susceptible to climate change. They live in the mangrove forests, which are very, very quickly disappearing because people want to expand. Um, and it's kind of that they think ecotourism is going to solve these problems, but it hasn't yet. So does anyone have any kind of insights or opinion on the concept of ecotourism? I personally think it's good. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it just, it gives people, because like we were saying before, like for a lot of people, if they don't see it, they don't believe it. 
where they don't care. So I think we were also talking about this last time with uh, aquariums and things like that. It just brings it to people. And like ecotourism is like that next step where, um, you know, people are going out into, into the wild and they're seeing it for themselves. So I like ecotourism. I wish that a lot of it could be done better because there are a lot of, for instance, like whale watching tours or whatever, they get way too close to the whales or they will, you know, they just, they, they're bothering the animals when they really should just be observing. Um, I know that um, gorilla tours really are still a problem for gorillas, even though they get so much money from these people that want to see them, that people are still getting too close and that diseases are being transferred. So like ecotourism could definitely be better, but the idea and what it can accomplish in people's minds, um, I think it's really good and we shouldn't stop it. No, I, I agree. Um, and it even comes back to what Dr. Bond was saying about education and awareness um, and what you said, how seeing is really believing. Um, I, I agree. I think that as long as it's not abused, so people aren't in it solely for the money and you're really there to kind of bring this awareness to conserve this beautiful whatever it is. Even is. I've never even heard of gorilla ecotourism. So that's really interesting to me, um, kind of preserving the species and their ecosystem. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Does anyone else want to kind of weigh in? So who decides who, I guess, regulates it? Like anybody can do ecotourism. Mm -hmm. It's just trying to live within, uh, within nature as much as possible, but who decides how close do you get? Like, is there like a line that you, you don't cross or? Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a, um, like for humpback whales, for instance, there's a certain distance that you can't be in. Actually, it's all marine mammals. Like you can't, in the United States at least, you can't get a certain distance to a marine mammal because they're protected under the Marine Mammals Act, which is U.S. government. So the U.S. government has a say of how close you can get to humpback whales, to the seals when you go on seal walks, any, anything like that. So, the government. <laughs> Do you think that ecotourism is going to increase in popularity, especially as we see kind of this decrease in biodiversity, so these places are kind of becoming more and more special? Or do you think that people are going to get maybe a little tired of this nature, let's go and do some good on our vacation? Can you repeat your question? Sure. So do you think that you're going to see that we're going to see an increase in ecotourism? Or do you think, so like, it's kind of, so to me, you want to go see things that are either really, really old or you might not be able to see again. And if you're getting to see this really unique piece of biodiversity that's being protected, because it might not be there tomorrow or the next day, that makes it very kind of lucrative. Or do you think that people are going to want to kind of go away and not have that almost not guilt, but that stress of, okay, I'm here, I have to do something good. Do you think you're going to, we're going to see an increase or decrease in ecotourism? Um, I say that an increase, because I feel like more and more people are becoming involved with environmental issues, especially like as education comes in and people are seeing, you know, on National Geographic, like the savanna, it's just so amazing and all these big animals and people do like going there and it's just another you know, thing. So it's not, I mean, we're not just talking about marine. I know I keep on bringing up like land things, but um, it's the same concept. I think that it will increase, especially, you know, if our economy, if, if economies in general just get better and people are wealthier and they're able to go out and do those things. But even with like national parks and things like that, people use those all the time. That's, you know, tax money and whatnot. So people still go out into the wild places and they do those things so ecotourism is like also the next step from that like i know out in montauk that they not only have whale watching but they also have the shark cage dives you can go out and see sharks on long island so it's not like you even have to go that far so um i think it would be increased i mean i don't i don't know if you were saying that people would get bored mm -hmm. about of it 
Was that what you were saying? Not necessarily even bored, just like, okay, so um, I have a friend of mine who is planning on going away for the winter, and she was debating between going to, like, Italy or there's an ecotourism in Costa Rica that she's interested in. But she felt that if she went to the ecotourism, it would be, her vacation would be almost, not marred, but it would be filled with kind of this guilt that she's there and she's trying to do good, but what will that really amount to? So it's almost, is ignorance really bliss when you're talking about a vacation? Oh, um, I don't know, because I've, I mean, my parents, they go to the same exact place to go kayaking every year, and they just love it, and it's not, I mean, and there's plenty of um, information about, you know, the bald eagles that they're trying to bring back or whatever, and, you know, as long as you're having that good message that, hey, this place is really good for bald eagles, and you can see them now when you go kayaking, and it, everything is going well, like, I don't really feel like it's, you know, to make you feel bad, like, it's like, this is a really great place, and, you know, as long as we have it, then there's nothing to feel bad about because they're there. And especially if you're giving your, your ego tours and like you going there is giving them money to keep that place running and to pay the guides and all that stuff. So you going there should make you feel really good because you're basically donating your time and money and your mind basically to that place. So I don't really see it as a, feel bad kind of thing it I guess it just all depends on the message like we keep on getting back to this topic of how to distill this message Mm -hmm. yeah so I I think that positivity is a good thing because you don't want people to go there and then feel bad on their vacation like they spend a lot of money sometimes going to the Antarctic and um you know Fiji and all these other places that have these amazing things yeah I, you know, I, I never thought of it that way. And I really, I really do agree with that. Um, definitely. So let's see. Okay. Um, I had a question come in about, um, what is being done in the U S about illegal fishing? Um, because I know that last time I talked a lot about kind of a worldwide perspective of illegal fishing and all that. And I did not have an answer until like a week ago. Uh, Obama actually just signed in what is called the Illegal Unreported and Unregulated Fishing Enforcement Act, uh, or the IUU Fishing Enforcement Act, which is super amazing. Um, It has a lot of different parts to it, um, but mainly... Its job is to prevent illegally harvested fish from entering the United States and supporting sustainable fisheries around the world, which is, like, super amazing. Um, Pretty much everything that 10 by 2020 stands for all nicely wrapped into one little piece. Um, In addition to that, it is trying to kind of weed out mislabeled fish or what's called seafood fraud, which kind of seems a little bit of a funny name to me. Um, Cause like when I think of fraud, I think of like money and people uh, like trying to swindle you out. But actually a lot of fish all over the world is mislabeled. Um, a study was just released by one of my favorite scientific bodies called Oceana and it was about Brussels. Uh, and they found that a third of all the f- seafood in Brussels was mislabeled for the sole fact of economic reasons. So they would take kind of a cheaper piece of fish and label it something more popular or more expensive to get more money. Um, For example, the most popular kind of mislabeled was for tuna, sole, and cod, and they were substituted by species that could be up to 40% cheaper. So people would be buying, like, from restaurants, the, the cod or the sole or the tuna, and they'd be actually eating who knows what. Um, but unless you're, like, a super foodie, like, I know, I wouldn't know the differences. If you gave me a piece of fish and told me it was cod, I'd be like, cool, great, thanks, food. Um, and it was found that sushi restaurants are the number one place where um, 
these kind of fraudy fish were found. Um, 54.5% of the fraud was found in sushi restaurants, which kind of really, really freaked me out because I really like sushi. Um, so now I have to kind of rethink that. But it's it's crazy. Like, if you're at a restaurant, you're going to assume that if you order whatever, they're going to give you whatever. Like, if I order a burger, I'm not going to get the pasta. Like, and that's something, okay, I can tell. But even, like, if I was to order one fish, I, I expect to get that fish back. Uh, so it's really trying to um, be a little more strict on seafood fraud, which is a really big problem, not only in the United States, but worldwide. Um, and once again, it's like the shark fin mafia. I just, what? Like, uh, that was crazy to me. So this is going to be really interesting to kind of follow through um, this new legislation because it's kind of one of the first of our kind. And it's really important because with this, the United States is actually joining the Port State Measurements Agreement, which um, is a global um, agreement, which I think 13 other nations have ratified and will be legally binding once we reach 25, but it prevents vessels carrying fish that have been caught illegally from entering the United States ports and keeping a little product out of US ports. So if your boat is caught, let's say in 2015 with illegal fish, you cannot come into the port in 2017, in 2020, you're, you're done. You're done. If you are found with illegal fish on your boat, you are done, um, which is kind of a really big deal. Um, that seems like what we were talking about the other day about enforcement and really like carrying a big stick. Like, that's just what you have to do sometimes. You really got to be, you know, a hard ass. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I agree. Um it's, it, I was so surprised, I'm not going to lie, that the United States has agreed to join this because it's such a big statement, um, especially when you think of all the seafood restaurants in the United States and, like, everywhere else that carries fish. Um, but it's, it's a really big kind of movement, and I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, there's also been recommendations about strengthening domestic enforcement authorities to address IUU fishing and fish products that have already entered the food chain. Um, because right now, the, a lot of the fisheries law in the United States focuses on at the dock enforcement. So kind of catching it before it gets in. But what happens when it accidentally does get in? Um, kind of keeping that keeping the, the, you, everyone kind of on their toes, like, okay, you managed to sneak it in, like, now you're gonna have to, you have to follow through. It's not, it's not like hide and seek, where if I don't find you, like, it's done. So, uh, I'm gonna, this is one of, like, my favorite, uh, favorite quotes, um, from the Under Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere, and she's also a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association Administrator, Illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing undermines both the economic and the environmental sustainability of our nation's fisheries. And that is Dr. Catherine Sullivan. That is such an eloquent sentence to me. So does anyone want to weigh in on what you think about this kind of crazy IUU fishing That's fine. Would you be able to type out that quote in the group chat? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. It was like, oh, uh, I was so happy when I saw this. My friend sent this to me. I was in class. Let's see. And let me make sure I get her name right. Dr. She actually has another quote. Um, 
Combating IUU fishing and seafood fraud is critical to sustaining the resilience of our global oceans fisheries, to leveling the playing field for the United States fishing and seafood industries, and to protecting the United States reputation as a leader in sustainable seafood. And I think it is so important that she mentioned environment, she mentioned policy, the economics, because like I, I, I'm sure I tire myself out saying this, the ocean is not just an environmental issue. It really is political, economical, social. And as kind of the powerhouse that we are, the United States should be a leader in sustainable seafood. But if we continue to let unsustainable or illegal fish in, it's kind of throwing that all away. So I was so happy that I saw that. I was so excited by that. Oh. And I want to kind of wrap this up on like one of the best notes in the world. Um, for anyone who was at MCC 2015, at that time in August, it was found that 2.12% the world's oceans were protected in some capacity. And the goal by 2020 is to have 10%. We know that there have been a lot of advancements um, between August and now, people, different countries, pledging parts of their ocean, even adding on to parts of their ocean for protected. And someone asked me like, well, what's, what's the current percent? And I didn't know. And it was just like a couple of weeks ago that the University of British Columbia released a study that 4% of the world's oceans lie within marine protected areas, which means that between August to November, we have seen nearly doubling. It's not 10% yet. It's not even half yet. But the fact that in only a couple of months, we've seen it jump from two to 4% is absolutely out of this world, phenomenal. Um, representatives met back in 2010 about the speedy loss of diversity, and that's kind of where this 10% by 2020 amount came from. Back in 2010, it took until now to get that as a sustainable development goal ratified. Um, and 10% in no way is enough, but it is such an amazing start. And to be at that 4% right now is, honestly, it's historic. Um, people are really taking Sustainable Development Goal 14 seriously. Um, and even this is considered a basic global goal, but you have to start with the basics. You can't build a pyramid if you don't know how to stock Lego blocks. Like, so this, this is like a crazy, crazy, Easy, good number. Um, some people are unhappy because they see it as, oh my gosh, 4%, you said 10%, you're less than halfway there, but really you don't get anywhere without that positivity. And I see it as, hey, from August to now, we've doubled our percent amount. And that is pretty much unheard of. Um, and while some of it, not all of it is this no take that is marine reserves, the protection is still there and the laws guiding the protection are still there and the policies that are there. So I am just like, I am so happy and I'm so happy that uh, someone figured out that between all the things that were determined in the last couple of months that we have added 2% of our ocean. That's a lot. 71% of our world is ocean. 71%, 2% of that? It's like 4% now is protected, 2% in the last couple of months. Like, mathematically, that's a lot. That's a lot. So I'm, I'm really, really, really excited that I, like, uh, got to share that. And I'm glad that people are really taking the ocean seriously uh, from every, every standpoint, whether you're here for the fact that you like the ocean or the smell or you're here for the policy or you're here for the manatees because honestly sometimes that's why I'm here but yeah does anyone have any last minute questions or comments you can either write in speak in ASL in no 
Cool, Julene, you have I have a question. Oh, yeah. Can you yes. guys hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I'm connected with my phone and my computer, so I don't really know which one to talk to. But um, could you, who was, um, released that information about the protected areas? I heard British something, right? Or Yeah, so the University of British Columbia uh, oh, okay. in Canada. And I'm going to post the study. And I find it a little bit funny. They uh, didn't sound too happy about it. The study is kind of more of a, oh, no, why are we only at 4%? Um, so they have kind of a different take, which is very interesting. Uh, I see it as, wow, holy, holy cow, we're at 4%. Like, wow. So, um, yeah, if, here, I can actually even send. I'm going to put the link in the group chat, but I will also post the link um, into the Facebook page and at my next email blast for anyone who isn't signed on right now. So. Thank you. No problem. I have a comment about yes. the 4% thing. I'm actually really surprised. Like I kind of, I was kind of being a pessimist about it and I kind of didn't think it was going to happen. Kind of like the lowering of carbon emissions thing. So I'm actually really like excited to hear this because I didn't know that until right now that we had 4%. That's, that's really awesome. Like I really didn't think it was going to happen. Honestly, I was really touch and go for a little bit. And like, I am actively involved in this. Um, I really only started to be involved in sustainable development goal 14 back in June. Uh, and I saw 10%. And like I said, I know that 71% of our ocean like is is the world's surface and I was like wow 10% that's like that's a lot that's like a lot and I, I was I was really skeptical but then I learned that we okay we're already like one-fifth of the way there like all right we have five years to get four-fifths of the way that's like less than one-fifth a year I was like doing the math in my head like calculating it out to see how like really viable it was and then I saw how much countries and people are really caring about really like getting this goal and, and this sustainable development goal and fulfilling it. And I was like, wow, people are so passionate about this. And it wasn't just marine science people or environmental science people, it was policymakers. It was um, sustainable development. It was all different sorts of people. And I was like, wow. This is amazing. So I, I was honestly equally surprised. <laughs> equally surprised. Any other questions or comments from anything from the forum? Nope. Want to add a quick comment? That was a really, really exciting statistic um, to share. I mean, it doubled since MCC 15. Like, the way you framed it, it was just mind-blowing and also um thank you for getting um dr mark bond to speak that was really really fascinating i personally had zero knowledge prior to this about sharks or why they were important and i'm excited to just start spewing fun facts to people about this um, i'm definitely going to bring this up in daily conversations um, and i took some notes of action steps that he mentioned and that you mentioned and those will be included in the email as well as the post form blog post. So exciting things are happening and I'm I know. looking forward to all of them. I actually, thank you for reminding me. I don't know how I forgot. Uh, let me pull it up. I do have um, a very interesting kind of online petition. Uh, let me make sure it is still there. Okay. So um, this is once again, an international petition but it's for the Australian Senate and Parliament to prevent the proactive killing of white sharks in Australia. Um, so white sharks are protected in Commonwealth waters and in the Western Australian state waters. Um, but the problem is, is that there is a, um, I guess they move so much that they can, um, kind of go outside of their areas of protection, which means that they are kind of free for all for people. And as Dr. Bond said, 
parts of the shark go for a lot of money, which I, I had no idea about. Um, so they're saying that the population of these white sharks that are in Australia are also connected to South Africa, to New Zealand and the South Pacific. So just because they're protected in one area doesn't mean that they stay in that area. And that's also why going back to Dr. Bond's marine reserves, um, they, they move around a lot. So this is um, a petition that actually, now that I'm looking at it, it uh, when, I, when I sent it to myself, it was active, but now it's not because it was victory confirmed. So the Australian Senate decided to prevent the uh, killing of white sharks in Australia. So I was going to send this to everyone to have them sign, but... With 90,182 supporters, it won. Ba -da -ba -ba -dum -bum. So, that's another good win. So, yeah. All right. Um, if, like I said, if anyone has any questions that you think of at 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. or whatever, everyone here, I'm pretty sure, has my email. I will send it out again. And if you're not connected with me on Facebook, that is my Facebook name, same as my real name. You can contact me at any time with any questions. Um, if there's a burning question that you have that you want addressed in the next global forum, which will be in January, taking December off because holidays, but more importantly, finals, um, let me know. And as always, please, please, please share our website, um, our Facebook, because really bringing the education and awareness. And since everyone here, sneak peek, there will be a fun kind of contest for December. So be on the lookout for that. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. That was another wonderful forum. Um, I hope you all had a great time and learned a lot and hopefully you know our gears are starting to turn after this slightly philosophical debate on ecotourism it's something i'm going to continue to think about um so yeah i hope everyone has a wonderful evening and i'll see you all hopefully at the next forum bye everyone bye.